Wow, what an amazing turnout here. So many excited, budding young scientists. Is everybody excited to be a budding young scientist? Yes? I, I can't hear you. OK. So the way this is going to work today is that I'm going to be doing very little talking, I hope. And I'm hoping that most of the stuff that uh, we're going to discuss is going to be questions or answers from you guys, OK? So we'll try to make this really interactive. And one way to make this interactive is for me to just tell you my name. It's a little bit of an unusual name. It's Shai, OK? So if you have a question for me, you can just say Shai, and then I'll try to answer it. And here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about two uh, questions. One is that we're going to try to address what is a cell. And Jeannie sort of already started the ball rolling with that, and we had a little bit of uh, discussion. And then we're going to move on to address why dying cells are good for you. And this may seem like a bit of a wacky uh, thing to think about, but hopefully we'll be able to walk through it and you'll, uh, you'll appreciate why this is a really, really interesting question. But before we even get there, I'm going to ask you something which is going to be a little bit, uh, seem a, a bit not, not relevant. Um, can anybody tell me what this is? Uh, over there at the stripes. An apartment building? It's a building, okay? And I'm going to ask you a question which is a little bit strange. Um, what's this? <laughs> oh, over there, what, what's that? Marge. Marge Simpson, and what, what, what is she? A Simpson. <laughs> Besides being a Simpson. A human. A human. She's a human, okay? So what I would like to know, I, I would like to know if you guys can think of ways, okay, in which a building, like this brick building here, <coughs> is the same as a human, like Mark Simpson. And I'll get the ball rolling here with one example, and then let's see if you can give me some more examples. So for example, with any building, there's a lot of pipes. The pipes carry a lot of um, they carry the steam, they carry water, they carry gas. And in humans, there's also pipes. These are the vessels that make up our circulatory system and that allow the blood to go all over our entire body, right? So can you uh, think of other similarities between a building and a human? Over there. Yeah? Buildings are made of tons of little bricks, just like humans are made of tons of little cells. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Can we think about other similarities over there? Uh, well, one of, my, one of my similarities is that the bot is that, is that, well, it's pretty simple if you think about it, but, if, but almost every living thing and almost every structure has atoms in it, and so the human is human body is made out of all atoms, okay. as well as brick and So if both of them are made out of atoms. That's great. Yeah. Um, in the green over there. Um, the, the generator and all those other technical things are like the brain, pretty much the control station. OK. There's a control station over there. Um, so, yeah. Um, buildings, they carry um, people and, and, and organisms in there, and human bodies, they have Billions of um, bacteria and microorganisms. Inside. Okay, so humans have organisms inside them, right? They have bacteria in the gut, and uh, buildings have organisms inside them too, which are people. So let's um, so let's go back to this building thing and to what uh, somebody in the audience already mentioned. What are the what is the facade or the outside of the building made of? Right. So if we look at the outside of the building here. There's <coughs> bricks, right? Do all buildings have bricks? No. No, but some do, right? So we're going to focus today on buildings that have bricks. And so somebody said that, well, this sort of is similar to um, what people are made out of. So let's, let's look at that. So here's Marge again, right? And we're going to try to figure out if she's also made of something that looks like bricks. So we're going to pick, <laughs> we're going to pick a part of her arm here. Right? And we're going to look really, really, really closely. Right? We're going to take this and put it as close as we can. 
And this is what we see. Do, do you see any bricks in here? Yes. <laughs> who, who, who sees bricks? Who doesn't see bricks? Yeah, I think that I, it's really hard for me to see the bricks here. But somebody, somebody in the audience mentioned that there are things called cells that might look like bricks here. How, how are we going to see them? What, what do we need to do in order to see them? Yeah. You want to speak up louder? You want to use a magnifying glass or a microscope? OK, so let's now use a microscope to look at Marge's hand, OK? And if you do that, so we're going right, to take her arm and put it under the microscope here. And if you do that, this is what you see. Okay? And this image here is taken using a very special microscope that has a very fancy name called a scanning electron microscope. Okay? And you'll actually, uh, if you want, during the tour today, you can visit the electron microscopy facility and see uh, some of these fancy microscopes. Okay. So every... All, Every person here has this kind of pattern on your skin when you look really, really closely. So, um, do you see bricks here? Do people see bricks? No. Here, I'll show you one. Here's one brick. Here's another one. Do you see them now? Here's another one. And what are these bricks called? Cells. Cells, right? So these are the cells. So here's another way in which um, buildings are similar to people, OK? So now I'm going to tell you a story about a building. So once there was a beautiful brick building, OK? And the people that lived in the building loved their building. And they loved to keep it clean. And they had this, um, they loved the color red. They wanted to keep their building all red. But then, one day, someone, and we don't know who, while everybody was sleeping, decided to mess up the building and paint one of the bricks blue. And that person, whoever it is, we don't, we, we don't know who it is, left. The people in the building woke up in the morning, and they saw this calamity, and they said, oh my, our wonderful, beautiful building has been tarnished. <coughs> There's something really ugly on it, OK? So um, they all you know, had a meeting. And in the meeting, they were trying to come up with ideas of what to do. How will they restore their building to what it used to be? OK, so does anybody here have any ideas? Over there. So you could paint over it with red, brick, with, with, uh, red uh, paint. So they thought about this, and they searched everywhere to see if they could find the same paint that was used to paint the building originally. And all the stores had run out of that paint. OK? So they couldn't do that, but that would have been a wonderful thing if they could have. O over there, in the red. They could replace the brick? They could replace the brick. So, so how would they do that? Okay, so, but can they just pull the thing out? No, they have probably some tools to break down the cement and to replace it. So you want to you want to break the cement so this part that's around here, right? This mortar that's around here. Yeah. Um, but then, if you do that, are you going to damage the bricks that are nearby? No. No. Yeah. 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 No. What do people think? Are you going to damage the bricks yeah. nearby? I think probably you will, um, unless you're very, very, very careful. So they would have to find a, a really uh, excellent uh, artisan that will enable them to uh, just remove just this part from the outside, right? What else could they do? They could just wash the paint off. They could wash the paint off. What a great idea. It turns out, though, that it's one of those annoying Sharpie kind of things that you just cannot wash off. What, what else? Yeah. You could scratch it off. 
you could scratch it off. But then, what do you think? Remember, the, the people in this building, they want to have a beautiful building, right? So if they have a building now that has all these scratches on it, you think they'll still be happy? Yeah. Yeah. You could paint the rest of the building blue. You could paint the rest of the building blue. That's a, another great solution. But remember, they love their red color. Okay? Yeah. They can use chemicals. Okay. So they can use chemicals. How, how would they use them? Um, just take some kind of chemical that could wash something that's permanent off and put it on it. But then if you use a chemical to sort of wash this thing off, then you're going to... Um, strip off also probably part of the brick, right? So now the brick is going to be a little bit uh, messed up, right? And remember, they want to have their building pristine, just like it was in the beginning, okay? Try to think creatively. You're allowed to think about, uh, you're allowed to think about things which are maybe not quite real, a little bit fantastic. Yeah. So you could paint it with a different color brick. Somebody mentioned that already, but they love their color. They have to stay with their color. Yeah. Um, yeah. You could put a painting over it. <laughs> they could cover it up. But remember, they love their building, right? Well, well let's do one more. Uh, OK, over there. Um, they, they could just replace the brick. They could replace the brick. Right. So the question, though, about replacing the brick is how are they going to replace the brick, right? Because the issue is. If they just try to drill through here to get to loosen this mortar, they're going to be damaging all these bricks around here too, and they don't want to damage all that stuff, right? They just want to, they want to have a beautiful building at the end, okay? So here's an idea. What if inside every brick was a little explosive, okay? So that here's our building right here, okay? Here are the bricks, and here's the blue one that uh, the vandal... Uh, messed up. What if there was an explosive so that what you could do is you could just, from the inside, the brick would just go, right? And then it would slide out. And it shouldn't hurt all the cells, all the bricks nearby, right? Because the explosive would be contained just to this region. Okay? Would, would that work? No. No? Why, why not? Because. Yeah. Because if you look at the model right there, if you knock down the second, if you knock down the second blue brick, the brick on top will fall down. Yeah. And maybe the whole entire building would collapse. Let's see. Maybe you're right. I'm, I'm curious now if it's going to fall or not. Maybe we glued it too hard. Yeah, I think it's a little too hard to get out. But, but actually, these are all connected, so I think it probably won't fall out. Okay, so... Uh, what we're going to do... What, the reason for talking about this explosive is that I want to tell you that what cells in your body do, which are the bricks that make up your skin, they do exactly that. They set up an explosive inside their, themselves. They destroy themselves. And then all the cells around that are protected. OK? And so, um, right, so I'll actually go back to, the, to this here. Right, and here, so here's, a, here's what I mean. So if we look at our skin cells, OK? They're arranged very nicely, like we saw in that scanning electron micrograph. And then if something goes wrong with one of the cells, like somebody paints something bad on it, okay, these cells set up an explosive. But this is a pretty weird kind of explosive, because what it does is it doesn't blow out. It blows in. And what happens is that the cell shrinks, so it loses all of its contact with its neighbors. The cell shrinks. And then it gets eliminated. But now we have a hole, right? So if this were the building, what will we do with the hole? Who, who, yeah, what will we do with the hole? Yeah? You'd get a new brick. You'd get a new brick, right? And stick it in there. 
So in our body, our body is even more clever. Our body can actually make new bricks by itself. And the way it does it, it this cell here splits into two. <coughs> two bricks. And then this one here will fill in the gap. Okay? So our bodies are very clever. They're able to uh, use this mechanism of destroying cells that are damaged, right? That have blue paint or that are damaged in any other way. They're able to destroy them and then replace them. Okay, so uh, I want to show you a video of what these dying cells look like, and you'll be able to see. Um, Okay, you'll be able to see what this, uh, what this death looks like. Okay, so here, it's a little bit difficult to see, but can people see that there's these round structures here? Yeah. yeah. So this, actually, these are cells, okay, that are all over this slide. And what you're going to see is that at some point, all of them are going to die, and the way that they're going to die is that they're all going to shrink into little balls, okay? So... Okay, here, here they are now. Suddenly, they're all shrinking into these little balls. Did you see that? Yeah? So this is what cell death looks like. This is how we destroy, in our bodies, cells which are not working properly. We cause an implosion where the cell just loses contact from all of its surroundings. Okay, so... Um, and just to show you a video of what it looks like when cells um, divide to replace the new cells, to replace the dead cell. This is what this looks like here. Okay? So what I want you to do here is to pay attention to this cell here, okay? This is a cell that's sitting in the culture dish. Okay? So it's actually not a cell in our body. It's a cell that's sitting inside a dish. And we're going to follow it in time. It sits here. And then it decides to divide and it splits into two. Pretty amazing, right? And it does it all by itself. That one's split into two. And here's another one. We'll see if it goes. Uh, we can rewind this a bit. Here's another cell here. And if you watch this one, it's about to split into two. And it's split into two. Okay? So this is how our body replaces cells which have died. Okay? So if cells die in our body, they die usually for a good reason, because something's wrong with them, and then we have ways of replacing those. Okay. So um, I want to tell you about a couple of other things that cell death is important for. But before that, I just want to put in a little plug for uh, my favorite animal, which is this animal here. Um, do people know what this is? What, what is that? Is Alex, a behind you. Worm. It's a worm. Um, what kind of worm is it? There's all kinds of worms. Is it an earthworm? Yeah. Is it an earthworm? You're, you're saying it's... A, how many people think it's an earthworm? How many people don't think it's an earthworm? Okay, now I will tell you, I'll give you a hint. This thing is not life size. Okay? These worms are really, really tiny. You can barely, barely see them, and they live in the ground. Yeah? Is it a tube worm? A tube worm. Uh, no, but it's somewhat related to a tube worm. I'll give you a hint. It's the number one worm on SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> What are the worms in SpongeBob? Do you remember what they're called? They usually are like these white tubular things that come in clumps and they run all over the place. No, not a tapeworm. Anybody watch SpongeBob recently? They're called nematodes. Do you guys remember the nematodes from SpongeBob? So this, this worm is the animal that we work with in my lab. And it's a really wonderful animal to do a lot of research on. And particularly, it's really useful for doing cell death research because we can look at all the cells inside the animal 
without killing the animal. Look, this is a picture of the animal. Do you see all these round things here? These are actual cells. And the reason we can see these is because the animal is transparent. Their skin is clear. So you can see inside, and you can follow everything that happens inside the animal as it develops. And one of the amazing things about this animal is that you can easily watch cells divide, and you can also watch cells die, which is why we're very interested in looking at it. So here's a really uh, amazing movie of how you make a worm. So worms, like people, are made from, uh, from an egg, right? So you have an egg and a sperm. They fertilize each other. Then you have one cell. And then that cell starts dividing. Remember, we talked about dividing cells. And then, eventually, you get a worm. And here's a movie of how you make a worm. Here's the cell that was just fertilized, OK, the egg. And here's just, we're just going to follow it. We're going to do this twice. So first, we're going to follow it. You see, all the cells are dividing. And because they're dividing, the cells are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And this doesn't look really like a worm yet, does it? But look what's going to happen. It's starting to look like a worm. And look, it's twitching, it's moving. And that's the worm. It's inside the eggshell. OK? And basically, you can sort of twist, trace it all the way around here. Eventually, it'll hatch out of the eggshell, and will look just like the worm that I showed you. Now, in this movie, um, I'm going to go back because I want to show you some interesting <laughs> things that happen. Particularly, I want to show you these dying cells. So the advantage here, remember before I showed you a movie of dying cells, but those were cells that are sitting in a dish. They're not part of an actual animal. But if you want to study how this happens in an actual living animal, this is a perfect system. And I'm going to show you what dying cells look like. Okay? So here, uh, here's... Here's an example. So we have lots of little cells here. There's one here which is a little bit hard to pick out. Okay? But if we move the movie forward, you guys see this button thing here? Yeah? That's a cell that just died. And it looks just like the ones in the dish where they all rounded up. Remember that? But the difference again is this is in a real animal. It really happened to this animal that this cell died. And it was supposed to die. Okay? And then it eventually gets cleared, right? It disappears. And if you keep looking, here's three more dying cells. Here's one. You see it? Here's another one here. And here's another one here. Okay? And actually, in the entire worm, 1,090 cells are born, and 131 of them die. That's a huge number, right? That's about 12% of the cell. So cell death is a very important thing for this worm to become a worm. Okay. So this is just to show you that we study cell death in these particular animals. And now I just want to give you two examples, besides the one that we've discussed, of why cell death is actually important. And to illustrate this here, I have this picture. What's this? It's a duck. So ducks are not people, right? OK, why are they not people? Like, what's the one, one example, the one thing on this slide which makes it clear why they're not people? <laughs> so what's, what's, what's different about their feet compared to our feet? Nathan? They're webbed. They're webbed. They have webbed feet, OK? Now, I'm going to tell you a really interesting fact. When all of you were inside your mother's womb, when you were developing from a tiny little egg, you all had webbing between your fingers. Is that amazing? So you were all ducks. <laughs> but does every, do people have webs now? Yes. Actually, some people who have uh, certain conditions will have it. But does anybody here have that? No. No, usually it's a very rare condition, right? Why don't we have that web? Yeah. Our hands start to, why we grow, um, our body starts to change. OK, but how does it change? Why do we not have the web? Yeah. The cells die. That's exactly what happens. So this web is made out of cells, many, many, many cells. OK? 
In us, when we're in the womb, we have the webbing, and then all the cells in between die. And that's why we have well-separated digits, well-separated fingers. But ducks fail to have their cells die. And that's why they have webs. Now, is it useful for us to have separated digits? Yeah. Is it useful for ducks to have webbed feet? Yeah, yeah? because that's how they swim, right? So you can see that nature has been able to play with cell death in different ways to give different animals different structures, different shapes that allow them to do different tasks. And the final example that I'm going to give you of why cell death is important has to do with this creature here. Anybody know what this is? Yeah. No worm? A worm. No, it's not a worm. It's a lot smaller. Uh, yeah? It's a bacteria, okay? Bacteria are really, really tiny organisms, and they're so tiny that they're made out of only one cell, okay? Each bacterium is a single cell. So here we have three of them. We have two smaller ones, and here's one that's a little bigger. And one thing that bacteria love to do is to divide, okay? And they make a lot of themselves that way. So uh, I'm going to actually just exit here and just show you a quick movie of what these bacteria look like when they divide, because it's actually kind of amazing. So our bodies are actually are full of these bacteria on our skin, inside our guts, and they're actually very important for us to live. And here's what it looks like when they divide. You see them splitting into two? Look at that. Pretty amazing, right? When you're sick, if there's a bacteria that makes you sick that your body doesn't like, one of the ways it makes you sick is because if this is happening inside your body. They're spreading and spreading and spreading and spreading and making you really sick. And so that's why um, we need an immune system that will get rid of these bacteria because eventually they'll just take over everything. Okay, so bacteria, this, so this final example that I want to tell you has to do with a bacteria that has this interesting name. It's called Bacillus subtilis, okay? And they look like these little rod-shaped things. And they have a very macabre or very um, uh, sinister use for cell death. And the story with these bacteria goes like this. These bacteria often like to live together on these surfaces, okay? And uh, every once in a while, they run out of food, okay? They usually like food that has nitrogen in it that makes up amino acids, for example, for, the, for those of you who know what amino acids are. But sometimes they find themselves in conditions where they just don't have enough food around them, okay? And so if they can't feed, what will happen is that they will all die. So what do you think? How could they use cell death to save themselves? Over there. They would eat what? They would eat each other. What is that called? Cannibalism. And this thing is called bacterial cannibalism. It was actually first described in Bacillus subtilis by Rich Losick, who's a professor at Harvard. And what he showed in this really beautiful set of experiments is that bacteria that are arranged in this kind of colony, in the middle, the cells will all die. And they sort of do this implosion that I described and spill all of their contents out. And all the yellow bacteria, which are happy and alive, will eat these guys. And so even though this is really gruesome, really disgusting, <laughs> it's really clever strategy for these bacteria to stay alive. Because if they didn't do this, all of them would be dead. At least this way, half of them will survive. OK? So this is another use for cell death. So we're going to summarize now what, we, what I told you about today. So why are dying cells good for you? Well, we talked about how they can um, replace. So we, we, can, we talked about how damaged uh, cells are gotten rid of and replaced by nearby cells. We talked about how they can give you shape, right? The difference between our digits and the duck feet. And we talked about how they can help feed other living things, right? So this is my presentation, and you guys were amazing. 
Great answers, great questions. And if you have some more questions, I'd be happy to take a few before we end this. Yeah? So like, um, the shows in the hand, why did they grow back when they died? Why didn't they grow back? That's a really good question, and, and I'll be completely honest with you, we have no idea why. And maybe you'd want to come to the lab and figure it out. Yeah? Is it true that like smaller cells can eat bigger cells? Or like the bigger cells can eat the smaller cells? So which cells can eat each other? Can small cells eat big cells and that sort of thing? Um, I'm trying to think about this. From all the stuff that I know, it's usually the bigger cells that will eat the smaller cells. And that makes some sense, I guess, right? Because you need to be able to stretch around them to be able to take them up, right? Um, but maybe you can find a counterexample, and then you can email me <laughs> what the counterexample is. Yeah? Say, say that again? That's right. So there. So um, there's been this debate. Does everybody know what an appendix is? Yeah. No. An appendix is this little organ that you have here. I actually don't have it anymore because uh, it got inflamed because bacteria went out of control, and the surgeon had to remove it. Um, and uh, so some people think that they store bacteria. Um, that help uh, your body function well. And I think it's still a big debate whether that's true or not. Um, but I will give you, so people call the appendix a vestigial organ. So vestigial means an organ that you don't um, need, that maybe you need, maybe some ancestor of ours needed millions of years ago, but now you don't need it. But I will tell you a very quick story about vestigial organs. There's a little gland here called the thymus. Okay, it's a little part of our, uh, it's maybe a little bit lower here, um, that's, uh, it, it's really very small, and in grown-ups, it's so shriveled and small that people always thought that it was <clears throat> a vestigial organ. And there used to be a time in the early 19th century, in the early 20th century, where um, people who got sick a lot had an operation to remove their thymus, okay? And many of these people died because it turns out that even though the thymus looks like it's a vestigial organ, it's the main organ of our immune system. And so if you're sick, the last thing you want to do is to take it out. So vestigial organs um, may exist, maybe the appendix is one, but we got to be really careful in deciding whether it is or not. Yeah. Yeah. Why do the cells in the ducts Say that again. Why don't the cells in the duct? Why don't the cells in the duct feet die? Because why don't the cells in the duct feet die? That's a really good question. <clears throat> we don't know the answer fully, but there is actually some work from uh, an amazing uh, scientist called Lee Nicewander, who had looked at a small protein called BMP. It stands for bone morphogenetic protein, and that BMP protein is important for uh, keeping these cells alive. Okay, so she found this one protein that's involved in that. Diana? Why couldn't you use magic to get the blue off of the brain? <laughs> Why couldn't you use magic to get the blue off? You know what? If you can find the spell to do it, you have to let me know. And then together we'll become rich. Um, Alex? Is that it's a pretty interesting question. Well, are cells are cells able are cells able to die but still be like cells die but still basically work even though they're dead? That's actually not a bad question. It sounds like a, a little bit of a crazy question, but it's actually not a not a crazy question at all. So when a cell dies, what I didn't show you is what actually happens to it at the end. And what happens to it is that usually another cell comes and just gobbles it up. Okay, so that cell that died can now provide nutrients for the cell that ate it, right? So just like with the bacteria. 
And so it's possible that even though this cell is not alive anymore and it's all destroyed, what was inside it helps keep the cell that ate it alive. And so in some sense it lives on. Okay? Any more questions? Nathan? Well, I, I have another reason why bucks and humans are very different that's not shown. The genetic coding is very different. They do have different, uh, different genes, although you'll be surprised how similar they actually are. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. And let me tell you actually one thing, which actually it's a point that I wanted to make, uh, two points that I wanted to make. You, you reminded me of this. If you took a cell from a duck and just looked at one cell and took a cell from you and looked at it, you couldn't tell the difference. Even more, if you took a cell from that worm that I showed you that we work in in the lab, and a cell from your body and put them side by side, you could not tell the difference. All cells pretty much look the same. And what's, what makes an animal special is how these cells are put together. Okay. The other point that I wanted to make, which is just a really cool fact about cell death, is that cell death happens in you and me every day, all the time. Okay. And we talked about the skin and how you have cells on the skin. All of these cells on the outer layer of our skin are shed constantly. And so you know how you have a lot of dust in your house? Some people have <laughs> dust in their house, right? Your parents are getting on your case to clean your room all the time from the dust, right, to wipe it off. Almost all of the dust in your room are cells that died from your skin and fell on the floor. Is that amazing? It's a lot of, du it's a lot of cells, right? There's a lot of dust in your house, and most of that comes from dying cells. Okay, yeah. How do stem cells work? How do stem cells work? Okay, that's a very complicated question. And we actually don't understand it fully. Um, but just to give you a very brief answer, is stem cells are cells that have the capacity to become any kind of cell. So if you have a stem cell, it can become a blood cell, or it can become a bone cell, or it can become a skin cell, okay? Um, and it's a kind of a magical capacity. Somebody was asking about magic. Diana was asking about magic. Stem cells are kind of magical because they can become any kind of cell in the body. And we now know a lot of ways of directing that. So if you take a stem cell, if we put some proteins on top of it, incubate it with some proteins, we can make it specifically become a skin cell or specifically become a blood cell or a brain cell. So we know a little bit about that process, but there's still a lot that we can learn about it. Yeah. yeah. So about what you just said about before, this, is a, this is a grown-up question, grown -up right? Question, yeah. You think quickly when you said yeah. that all that dust can be uh, our skin. Um, so if you're allergic to dust, does that mean you're allergic to your own cells? That's uh, that's an interesting point. So uh, people have this. Uh, each person has this uh, wonderful capacity to recognize its own cell. And that's why we don't just explode in this one big immune reaction. So uh, it's called self-recognition. And I mentioned that thymus. This is where a lot of that uh, education of the body about which cells are part of your own and which are not comes from. Um, but if I could imagine that if you happen to be allergic to uh, somebody else's cell, Right? That could maybe be a reason for allergy. So sure. I don't know that there's an example for that, though. I don't know that that's actually been shown. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does this process for uh, animal cells to, uh, to like, uh, be replaced, if they're, can it also work in plants? So the question is, does cell death also work, cell death and replacement also work in plants? And it absolutely does. So. Plants use a different, uh, a different mechanism of killing their cells. And um, often their cells will be killed by viruses or by bacteria. But then the neighboring cells will divide and fill in the gap. So this is a very, very ancient uh, mechanism. So probably from the first organism that existed a billion years ago that had more than one cell, it probably already figured out how to replace cells that died in its body. Yeah? So I, I have another adult question. In the video that you showed with the 
emergence of the worm and the cell death in the worm, were all of those cells dying because of some historical reason that the feature was no longer required in the worm? Or is the organism since in now the form cells right. based on policing itself? So that's a really great question. So the question is, why do all those cells in the worm that I showed you die? And um, the answer is that out of the 131 cells that die in this animal, um, they're all, it's always the same cells that die. They always die exactly at the same time. And so in fact, you can tell whether one of the a cell is going to die before it actually dies, which is one of the reasons this is such an amazing animal to study. We can't do this on other animals. So only nematodes are good for this. And, um, but why they actually die is a mystery except in one case. Um, and that's the one case that we study actually in my lab where if that cell doesn't die, the animals are infertile because their uh, um, uh, uh, sexual organs basically are not able to um, release sperm. So uh, we only know, but that's the only example. So there's 130 extra cells uh, that we need to understand why they die. Yeah. So that's a lot of projects, right? That's at least 130 people in the audience here today. Yeah? Do you use HeLa cells in your research? Do we use HeLa cells? Uh, we almost don't, because HeLa cells are human cells, right? And uh, we don't study human cells. We study worm cells. Yeah? Yeah? Say that again. Can you use that to defeat tumors? That is a wonderful idea. And the an answer is a resounding yes. Okay? Absolutely. So your immune system has this remarkable capacity where it can recognize things that are foreign, like we just talked about. And often it's very difficult for it to do that with tumor cells. But if they can recognize the tumor cells, what, the, what these immune cell, cells do is that they go over to the tumor cell and they say, listen, buddy, you're no good. It's time for you to kill yourself. And the tumor cell kills itself. And I don't know if you guys have been sort of up on the recent developments. It's been a little bit in the news about um, these immunotherapy treatments for cancer. And they work exactly the way you described. So they uh, take cells in the immune system, target the cells that are tumorous, and cause them to die. And the death is this regular kind of implosion death, which is what's responsible. Yeah? If, they, um, if a cell dies and the neighboring cell isn't fast enough to replace it, can something else replace it? If a cell dies and a neighboring cell is not there to replace it, can another one replace it? No, a different, a different kind of cell. So. Like a different neighbor, you mean? Or, so it could be a different neighbor that would replace it. Or, like a, different cell. or a different cell from somewhere else. Um, so in the blood system, for sure, that can happen. Because that's a system that's not sort of fixed in space, because things are circulating all the time. But if you're in a tissue um, that's <coughs> fixed, that can't really move, um, I don't know of any example where a cell from far away comes to replace that one. It's usually the cell right next door. Yeah. 